Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the BritCham Singapore's Mergers and Acquisitions in an Unpredictable Environment webinar. At the risk of using an overused phrase, these are unprecedented times indeed. I'm Chris Sassitharan, MD and founder of REN Advisory, a human talent consultancy that works with organizations to implement people strategies, thereby helping develop them into high performance cultures. Prior to REN Advisory, I have 20 plus years experience in HR leadership roles across Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. This webinar is being uh, brought to you by the Brit Cham Singapore's SESB, which is Startup, Entrepreneur, and Small Business Committee, of which I'm co-chair, with the support of the Finance and FinTech Committee. Now, some quick housekeeping tips. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we will run through the content, at the end of which we will open up for Q&A. Please feel free to pop your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens or on the floating toolbar via this function at any time during the webinar. And we will aim to address as many of your questions as possible, depending on the time we have. I've also been asked to inform you all that this webinar is being recorded. Now, let me introduce you to today's speakers. Um, we have two, um, Damien Adams. Damien, if you want to sort of wave I'll give, give the audience a quick wave. There you go. Damon is a partner at international law firm Watson Farley Williams. Uh, Damon advises founders, startups, uh, VC and uh, PE, so venture capitalists, private equity firms and infrastructure investors and international organizations on investment, M&A and other corporate transactions across a range of sectors. Based in Singapore since 2000, he has, he has over 20 years of experience in structuring negotiating, managing, and executing complex cross-border investments and transactions. From greenfield, early stage, and growth capital investments to joint ventures, mergers, and acquisitions. Samuel Olson, Sam, quick wave, please, um, is the co-founder of Metis Intelligence and a strategic advisor to a number of technology and creative companies, including on M&A. An award-winning entrepreneur, he has deep experience in helping companies grow organically and inorganically in Asia-Pacific. This includes the sale last year of Happy Marketeer to Dentsu, the largest ever digital deal in Southeast Asia. Before that, Sam served as a British Army intelligence officer in Iraq and Kosovo and is a graduate of Oxford University. Right, <clears throat> now that we've got the housekeeping stuff out the way, let's crack on. I guess something like M&A has always featured uh, on the business agenda, you know, whether it's selling or acquiring, um, for instance, founders uh, may view a sale to cash out. Uh, acquirers may view this as a way to expand uh, into new you know, geographies or even stifle competition. However, in times of crisis, um, you know, there can also be many other reasons to consider a sale or an acquisition. Now, in this session, we will try and cover M&A considerations from three key perspectives. Um, the deal itself, uh, legal aspects, and last but not the least, the impact on employees. So the people side of things. Sam, what are your sort of kind of thoughts on, uh, you know, on, on this topic that we picked for today's webinar, especially in the current COVID crisis environment? or for that matter, in any crisis? Uh, well, it's, it's a very interesting topic at the moment for a number of reasons and for a number of people. Uh, there is a great deal of angst in the business community globally, but uh, of course, here in Singapore and in Southeast Asia, we're, we're not an exception. And we're seeing lots of the indicators for the general economy weaken, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, so uh, there will be in the mind of a lot of companies with a small, medium, large, whatever, the shareholders and the founders will be thinking, actually, is this the right time to sell or not? And there could be quite a few reasons for that. First would be that they're just running out of money. Uh, as I said, it's quite tough trading conditions. Secondly, uh, and we're, you know, we're at Britchan, there are a lot of uh, expats here. Uh, and many of them will have companies, but their partner may need to move back to the UK or to Australia or whatever uh, for personal, for their own career reasons. And so they'll be looking to exit the company uh, or you may just have had enough and uh, there's no real shame at all. Uh, but there's an awful lot of entrepreneurs 
uh, and business leaders, especially on the smaller side of businesses, who simply run out of steam. And when you know you've got six months, a year, two years, even three years, some people are saying, of horrendous trading conditions ahead, and I don't think it'll be that long, but it's just, you know, some of the people are saying that in the market. If you've got that ahead of you, then people just might think, what's the point? I can do better things in my life than struggling to uh, keep a business afloat. And so <clears throat> with all these things, m and does come to mind. And the question is, what is the best way to go about um, any uh, merger and acquisition? And what are the trips, uh, the tips, sorry, the tricks uh, to learn to make sure that it goes well? And then on the flip side, there are also an awful lot of buyers out there who have uh, thought this is a good time to be able to accelerate my own strategy by looking at inorganic solutions and thinking, well, who out there would be a good partner for me to buy moving forward? And uh, there are quite a few discussions I know happening at the moment. The question is, is the, uh, for the buyer, is this the right time if you're looking at distressed assets? Um, because often those distressed assets don't work out as well as they might do if they're bought as a, as a more, in more favorable conditions. And for the seller, is it the right time if you're looking at being bought as a distressed asset uh, and if you have got the, the, the guts to keep going and you've got not enough money, is it better actually to wait for a few years until things are settled down? Or indeed, actually, is now the right time to go and f actively find a, a buyer who themselves might not be firing on all cylinders, so therefore you might be able to get a better deal out of it. So there's lots of, lots of uh, moving parts to the M&A discussion at this moment uh, because of the crisis. Thank you, Sam. Damien, do you have anything else to kind of add to that or any other thoughts uh, that come to mind? Yeah, I think just building on what, what Sam said, I mean, I think, I think at the moment we're you know, in an environment where people are to some extent waiting to see what happens next. I mean, it's, it's every major market event that happens there is often, certainly from our perspective, we see you know, the promise of a wave of, of you know, M&A coming down the track. There's consolidation to come. I think in this environment, we certainly see uh, an uptick in restructuring necessity or opportunity and that inevitably brings with it some m a opportunities so i think people are are certainly thinking about that i mean just just in slightly binary terms i think the way i see it as i say sort of echoing sam is to some extent you have those that have to do m a and those that are able to do m a uh, and those are perhaps two sides of the same coin insofar as you have you know uh, willing buyers or um, forced sellers perhaps in the in the worst extremes um but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, it's, it's never off the table. Uh, but I think in times like these, it becomes even more critical. People think about the opportunities. Uh, and, and also, I think it's um, even for good quality businesses, you know, there is, there is a point at which they look at whether there are certain parts of the business that are core or non-core. And so you start to see an increase um, in, in sort of carve out transactions, which again, present them, present opportunities. So um, a multitude of reasons, but very much, yeah, very much echoing what, what Sam said, I think, on that front. Okay, thank you for that. So we're, we're going to cover this, um, this session now in, in kind of five or six stages of an M&A um, transaction, as it were. Um, let, let's start with the first one, which is, you know, when, when people think about, when founders uh, or business owners uh, start to think about deciding to sell. <clears throat> um, Sam, you know, what's kind of going through, you know, in your sort of dealings with founders, etc. what's typically going through their mind at this stage? Um, you know, when, you know, let's say clients approach you and said, look, I want to sell my business. You know, what's the kind of conversation you tend to have with them? Well, uh, I think it may be useful to use uh, Damien's sort of binary list and those that have to sell and those that are thinking about selling, even though they don't need to, because it is a good differentiated between two different mentalities. So we just start with the people that think they have to sell for some of the reasons I've mentioned already. Then I think that uh, often there is like, uh, a, a, there's a sense of s slight panic in the sense of one has to s make the sale within a certain time frame, either because you're leaving or because you can't be doing it more than three months more of your life or whatever. Uh, and in that case, I think that it is very hard to make a good sale simply because it, it, it normally takes between six, at least six, if not nine to 12 months to make, 
to make a proper uh, sale, whatever size the business is. I mean, obviously there are exceptions to the rule, but there, but there's also different time, different time scales depending on the type of sale. So in essence, you've got two different ways. Uh, you can either do an asset sale or you can do the sale of a, of a, of a, of a, of a business, a viable business. Uh, an asset sale is when you just say, okay, I just want to sell my, my, sh my shop, my stock, uh, or if you're a tech company, for example, it could just be sell your IP or and sell your business book, uh, and it's it's something that you will disassociate yourself from once the sale's gone through. They don't need you, they don't want you, uh, and that case you can do a sale a lot quicker. But the downside is that you don't sell for as much money. Uh, often, in fact, almost all cases for anywhere near as much money as you'd, you get if you were selling a, a, a viable business. Uh, and which brings me on to that side. If you have got a, a business and you want to sell it and you, uh, you're you doing it because you think you want to, but the, you don't need to because you, you've got enough money, you don't, you're not going anywhere, but perhaps you feel that you'd be better off to be part of a bigger organization, then that will, and that should take you sort of, as I said, nine to 12 months. Uh, and you will, uh, you will need to make sure that you go through all the, the normal due diligence steps and, and work out the, the exact terms of the deal and hopefully get an earn out situation where over a period of two to three years, you can, you, you basically sell the company in, in stages so that you make more money at the end. So just going back to the original question of what's going through their mind, if you can, keep toughing it out and you don't have to go, then you should be looking at a, a, a selling the business as a, as a viable company with a long-term strategy in mind. But if you can't, then you might need to resort to an asset sale, but be prepared to sell it for a lot less money than you would do if it was a normal time and you were doing it for uh, selling the, the business as a viable company. Thanks, Sam. So kind of uh, the, the sum of the parts <clears throat> is worth more than the sort of parts in, in you know, in sold, sold off separately kind, kind yes. of thing. Um, Damien, given what Sam's just said about, you know, whether you're selling, you know, whether it's an asset sale or IP or shares or part or whole, et cetera, from a, from a legal perspective, how does that impact the process, um, you know, either time taken or any other considerations from a, from a lawyer perspective? Uh the risk of sounding cute in a word enormously. Um, I mean, I, I think the context, a bit of background to the context, I guess, of, of this, um, this chat um, is, is probably relevant insofar as, you know, we're, we're going to keep coming back to it looking most, most predominantly, but not exclusively from a sort of a founder sale or, or, or you know, business owner sale perspective um, more than anything. I, th I think the other thing that I think plays in on, on the legal side is that we, we, probably aren't in the minds of a business owner when they're making that decision. It's probably after they've already made the decision or, or the process has started to some extent. But I think observations that I would make in terms of how, um, how the decision plays into the impact is, is um, important insofar as knowing, knowing what you're selling and knowing what you want to sell and understanding how quick that is going to allow a buyer to get to grips with what they may potentially be buying, the level of due diligence that they're doing, the structure, um, the treatment, you know, to tax, if any, in certain jurisdictions, the processes that you have to go through. I mean, just, just in very simplistic terms, the difference between a quote unquote quick sale where you're just selling everything lock, stock and barrel, you know, forces a buyer to go through a much more rigorous due diligence process to get comfortable with what they're saying, with what they're potentially buying, with looking at, you know, for any skeletons in the closet, you know, negotiations around, uh, you know, warranty protection, potentially indemnities, certainly on things like tax and so on. It's a much more rigorous process that puts the seller through a lot more hoops in terms of um, just getting things in place. Uh, the flip side of that, you know, which I think, you know, as, as you say, perhaps, represents less in terms of overall value because you can look at things on a slightly cherry picking basis, you know, an asset sale um, perhaps cuts through so many of those issues because it becomes a very focused, very specific uh, transaction. I've seen in many, many occasions where one has become the other for various reasons throughout. So an asset sale that started as such has become a share sale or, or more usually it's a share sale suddenly becomes an asset sale um, because 
as people do due diligence, they realize that in actual fact, they'd rather not have this part or that part. And so they'd be happy to pick up certain bits of the business. Uh, and maybe that's where they start to identify where the real value lies. I think from a from an owner perspective, it's important to have an appreciation of what has driven you to this point in terms of the transaction itself and therefore what you are looking to sell. The, the relevance in that is also the universe of buyers that you might potentially look to. And we'll come to this later, I think, in terms of you know that aspect. But it is important because different buyers will have different considerations depending on where they see the value. You know, if it's a purely financial investor, if it's a strategic buyer, if it's a competitor, you know, if you're reaching out to different groups of people uh, through the process, what you're offering for sale uh, is, is, is going to be important to, to that sort of narrative around the transaction. So it does, it does feed in um, a great deal, I would say. Uh, and, and one thing that we're going to probably um, come back to again and again is that it's all in the preparation of the planning. So thinking about this, you know, as far ahead as possible and having a not inflexible, but pretty firm view on, on you know, what the transaction is going to look like um, is, is an important consideration. Okay, great. Um, listen, from, from, a, from a people side of things, I think at this stage, um, what I can sort of add to this conversation is um, it, it's about the comms piece. Um, so for, from an HR standpoint, some of the things that um, HR teams get involved in at this early stage um, is, you know, who, who do you bring into the, dare I say, circle of trust? Um, because at the very early stages, the fewer people that know about this, the better. So it's a price sensitive, uh, you know, it's, it's a decision that, um, you know, the senior management are kind of taking uh, and not taking lightly. So one of the key things that, um, you know, I would say the organization's leaders need to look at is uh, from a comms perspective, who do they bring in? What do they tell them? How transparent are they? But then also start to think about rolling out a comms plan where gradually you start to bring more and more of the organization into the fold. Um, the sooner, the better, uh, but, but clearly um, confidentiality is a, is, is a key piece. Let's move on to David, what you've kind of um, already alluded to, which is, the buyer stage or identifying buyers. <clears throat> um, and since you've brought that up, I'll, I'll come to you first this time. Um, can lawyers help source buyers? Is that something that law firms generally do? And then, you know, we'll, we'll sort of move on to Sam and, and you know, what, what he does in his role um, at, at, at Metis. Uh, guarded, guarded response, can, yes, generally no. Um, I mean, yeah, the, law, lawyers, lawyers can help. I mean, obviously they've got, um, you know, relationships and contacts and networks and so on that, that, you know, potentially provide, um, buyers, but, but it's not the bread and butter of what, you know, lawyers do. I mean, I, I have been involved in processes where, um, for, I think largely driven by economic reasons, um, organizations have asked if, you know, if we can assist. And so we've gone through, we, we sort of played the de facto role of, of, uh, what a corporate, you know, corporate finance advisory might do. I think the the guarded element of that response would be that you know that they are not front and centre in terms of and licensing for actually going out and sourcing uh, sourcing potential acquirers. So um, yes, I mean lawyers are certainly people that you can talk to, uh, but they're probably the first port of call. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 the um, you know they they are themselves um, as I say con constrained in actually how they can go out to market you know in terms of <coughs> securities and futures legislation and so on and so forth. Okay, okay, Sam, um, your your kind of turn. You know, how, how does how do you how does one source buyers? You know, how does a potential seller source or go sourcing for potential buyers? Um, what about sort of pricing um, and and the structure of the deal itself? You know you know, earnouts, uh, et cetera. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, there's two types of deal, really. The first is a, a warm sale and the second is a cold sale. A cold sale is when you, you put your hand up and say, does anyone want to buy me? And that's when you go out to market with a teaser and you identify companies that are the right size for you, that um, 
looking to buy, looking to expand. So you, you've got some intelligence that they are um, actually you know, wanting to make an acquisition in your, in your space. And you basically take a punch and say, here's a one page uh, about what, who we are. Do you want to have a conversation about a, about a sale? And that does happen, uh, certainly. But by far, the, the most likely scenario is what's called a warm sale. And that's when you actually sell to someone who you already know. And that knowing part normally means a, having a commercial relationship. And so um, if you look at, for example, Grab or whatever, they've made a, a few acquisitions, but almost all of them will have been made with companies that they're already partnering with or they've already got to know through some commercial way. Because that just means that uh, they are sure, more sure Hundred percent, but more sure that the, the 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 sale will actually create commercial value, and that's at the forefront of the individual who is brokering the deal. Because if you're if you are the head of corporate M and A from from a buyer's point of view, you will get fired if you screw up and you buy a company that does not create value. And so they are very keen to make sure that whoever they recommend to their board to buy is actually going to lead to an economic advancement or financial advancement for that company. Uh, and therefore, having that commercial relationship already means that that's a shortcut to, to achieving that certainty. Cold sales do buy, uh, do happen, as I said. But the other reason, the other issue about cold sales is that without much relationship, it can be quite difficult, especially in the less than normal sectors where you might be looking at different types of valuation. I'm sure we can talk about valuation in a bit, the ways to do that. But if, you, if you're not a sort of purely normal company in inverted commas, then, not you, then cold sellers, people coming into the business with, with a fresh pair of eyes, might not know how to properly value the company. And I've certainly seen that, for example, in technology, where you get uh, old world buyers trying to make purchases of, of new, new companies, new technology companies, they simply don't have the board support to be able to come up with with the valuations that would be expected uh, the, the seller might expect and in this time when people are perhaps looking at more distressed sales or distressed buys if you've got no commercial relationship and no trust built then it might be seen as easy pickings for perhaps less scrupulous buyers say so, well here you go this is a bit of money it's they know it's way below what it should be given below what the market would expect, but there's no trust there. There's no warmness in the relationship. It's just a cold punt. And uh, unfortunately there will be sellers there who think they've got no choice but to accept. Okay, great. Um, moving on and conscious of time as well. Um, we now look at sort of, you know, this isn't necessarily a sequence, but if we, if we look at the legal aspects of the sale and the prep work involved, uh, and Damien, I'm going to turn to you uh, for, for your kind of expertise on this. Um, can you shed some light on, you know, stuff like the sale process, uh, you know, what sort of a sale process, uh, how, how, you know, how companies are sold, are there different ways in which handled um you know talk about exclusivity um and so on can you shed some light on, on, on that please yeah sure i mean i think it just builds on what what we were discussing earlier about um knowing what you're selling uh and also what sam was saying about um you know engaging with someone who's actually going to help you find uh you know warm warm introductions in the market um i mean i think i i think in terms of process and it's it's fairly on in the thinking there's some consideration to be given as to whether you're going out to a you know pre-qualified however you determine yeah. qualification but a pre-qualified group of uh you know potential bar uh and how you would get to those potential buyers um whether you're going to try and you know from a seller's perspective maximize value by running the warm process so that you're looking for people to engage in you know bidding uh for the company or for the assets um, whether you're going to go in on a, you know, simple bilateral uh, and have a conversation with buyer and then exclusivity plays into that. You know, if you're giving exclusivity around preliminary due diligence, around initial discussions, um, you know, if you are engaged in a very preliminary process to try and get to some sort of heads of agreement or term sheet, you know, how that's going to play, you know, if that's a 60-day or 90-day exclusivity, perhaps shorter, 
then you know what does that mean for your own um, aspirations and expectations if that ultimately doesn't result in any sort of a deal so um, yeah I think I think knowing what approach you want to take uh, and, and again what what is what is going to be best I mean auction sales uh, you know for example have their own you know uh, embedded issues with regards to length length of time to allow people to go through you know obviously you're giving multiple people the opportunity to go through your business uh, some engage in auction as, uh, as as a price discovery or fishing exercise um, you know so so there are ways or there are, there are means um, reasons sorry for, for which you might want to, not to engage in that so I think I think just um, I mean it's not really into the nitty-gritty of the legal but I think it, it does again come back to that point about um, deciding what process and approach you want to follow um, with regards to actually the, the sale as a whole. Okay, terrific. Sam, anything else to, to, to sort of add in that sort of legal aspects or prep work from, from your end? No, um, but well, yes, I suppose. Um, there is perhaps uh, the, the time now to talk about maybe what buyers are looking for, because that will, that will reflect on some of the, the, the legal side. But in essence, there are five things that buyers, uh, five categories that, that, that the buyers look at when, when working out whether to buy a company. And, and if so, to buy the company, then what value to ascribe to it. The most important thing is the offering fit. Um, and that just that basically decides whether there will be a deal or there won't be a deal. And what I mean by that is, will buying company X actually add to us strategically? And so it could be that company X it fits into a hole that you already have. You're not be able to sell certain type of widgets, and company X make those widgets. So what a perfect fit. Or it could be that they offer a different service, or it could be that they are doing the sale of a service in a way that you think you need to bring into your whole company, i.e. modernizing the firm. There could be technology issues, which they will solve if you buy them, et cetera, et cetera. And everyone there should have an understanding as to how you can approach a buyer in the knowledge of what you will do for them. And I always call it the, the wow factor, which is that they should, the buyer should look at the, the, the seller and say, wow, that's such an amazing company that we've got to have them, or that's the best widget bot maker in the whole of Asia, therefore we need to have that. If you cannot say what your wow factor is, then you need to go back to the, to the drawing board because buyers really only want to buy companies where they can say that there is some kind of superlative attached to it. It is the best, it is the most successful, it is whatever it is. And so get that right in your mind and say that, and, and have that ready to say, but once that's been approached and that the, the buyer knows that they're, they're, they're going to get something which is the best or some kind of superlative, then everything else falls after that. And those four other categories are one, financial excellence, two, management excellence, three, clients, and four, your readiness for sale. Uh, financial excellence is, are you making a profit? Are you doing well? I mean, if you're not, if you're financially up, up, up a creek, then it's going to be a very, very different conversation. And a lot of companies won't buy because of that, but some will. And the, go back, the most important thing, as I said, is the offering side. Then you've got the management excellence. Are you actually, as a company, uh, do, do you bring with you a good management team? Uh, which can fit into the buyer and actually keep running the company uh, rather than just sort of being a fire and forget to so you buy it and then all the managers leave and then they just they're stuck without the people that they wanted to bring on in the first place the next one is clients do you bring with you a good list of clients that you that you maybe you wanted to target have been able to uh, reach for a while or actually just a new a new bucket of clients that are good and finally and this goes back to Damien's point readiness for sale uh, one of the biggest issues around sales being aborted is skeletons being found in the cupboard. And that could be skeletons around tax or visa issues or something like that. Uh, or it could be as preserved because they don't have, the, the, the seller doesn't have their contracts with their clients sorted out or they've got, uh, they haven't got their, their, their rent paid on time or something like that. So just make sure your house is absolutely in order. You've got all the contracts with the staff, all the contracts with the clients, all sorted out. You've got your management accounts published for the last three years. You're, you're, you've got no issues from the finance point of view. And all of those things, which are called hygiene factors, 
uh, will make your, 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 your sale through the process a lot easier than if you've got issues which basically cause people, to, the, the buyers to either pause or to even pull out in worst case scenario. Okay, great. Um, listen, um, from, from, a, from the employee side of things, I think this is a, a critical part of the process. Um, and, and typically it'd be helpful to kind of work through, through checklists. So if, if you're thinking about, um, you know, either selling or buying, um, certainly an acquirer will want to know what terms and conditions the employees are, are on. So, and, and one of the critical aspects that I've found in some of the deals that I've been involved in from, from an HR side of things, which is very close and can be quite an emotional topic is, um, is retirement benefits. Um, now, probably less so in Singapore because of CPF and, 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 and stuff. Um, but, you know, when you're looking through the list of benefits that employees have uh, from an acquiring and a selling company, you know, what's, what's the sort of health plans? Um, you know, what other insurances do employees have? You know, when the employees are transferred across, if it's a full sale with employees, then you need to look at these things as well. Um, to see whether they're adverse uh, to, to what you offer as an acquirer uh, or, or whether they're, uh, they're better. And, and if that's the case, you need to start to think about how you would address some of these concerns from the employee standpoint. Um, kind of moving on to, to, to the next uh, sort of stage, <clears throat> due diligence. Uh, so this is when, you know, all the stuff is starting to come together. Um, and, uh, and, and things are kind of gathering pace. Now, I guess sometimes, you know, dare I say, is, is there a danger here, Sam, that, you know, how do you kind of test whether the acquirer is a, is a, is a bona fide acquirer or are they fishing for information, et cetera? You know, what, what kind of tips or insights can you give our, um, our listeners uh, to, to, to this particular side of things? Yeah, it's a very good question. And if anyone's watched the Silicon Valley TV show, uh, there's a rather distinct uh, phrase, an ugly phrase that comes, comes to mind from that, but it does happen. And you, uh, well, one of my clients at the moment, we, we had that uh, scenario where one of their competitors said that they wanted to have a chat about a potential sale. We went down having a few conversations. Uh, we were suspicious, so we didn't uh, we were very careful as well, so we didn't give away any issues, but it was quite obvious that the particular competitor did not have much intention of, of buying. They just wanted to know all of the details. And for that, <clears throat> that's why it's important to, to be careful and to be suspicious during this, but not in a, in a bad way, but in a, in a pr productive way. And what I mean by that is keep, a, keep two sets of documents. The first is your teaser, which basically lists out your, what you want the world to know about you, that you're profitable, that you're doing well, that you're the best X, Y, Z company, and make sure that you realize that that teaser, one or two pager, will probably go to your competitors. People around the world will see it. In fact, you want them to see it because you want everyone to know what, that you are potentially on the market. But keep your, what's called a business summary, which is 30, 40, 50 pages, whatever it is, where you've got all the details of your business. So your in-depth financial analysis, your, uh, your company structure, your legal issues, and all the, all the things that the potential buyer needs to know through due diligence, but you don't want them to um, know off the bat of it, of, straight off the bat. Keep that separate and only release it when you've got an NDA uh, signed by the potential buyer. Now, a lot, obviously, NDAs, their, their efficacy in the legal side, Damien can talk to you more, and a lot of people say that they don't mean anything because you're not going to take that potential buyer to court if they, if they spill the beans or they use that information in a bad way. But, but having an NDA is just, again, to use that phrase, a hygiene factor, and means that there is a less chance that they will use it nefariously. So keep the critical information separate, and make sure you guard that so that if you do have someone you're a bit suspicious of, make them go through hoops first to see that they are, that they are, they are true and valid. And, and one good way to sniff out is to get them to give you some information, a proprietary information. And if they're willing to share with you some of their financial issues, and you can say that quite simply because I don't know whether you've got enough money to buy me or I don't know whether you what your plans are you need to share with me your strategy if they are willing to if the buyer is willing to share with the seller some some proprietary information then that means 
that they're more likely to be uh, to, to be kosher and, and not going to be doing that awful Silicon Valley phrase. Okay, super. So, David, from 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 the legal side of things, you know, getting the house in order, you know, preparing for the due uh, due diligence, getting all the stuff in the data room, etc. I mean, Sam's Sam spoken about perhaps having document A and document B, um, and and kind of drip feeding some of this uh, via the data room. Any, you know, do, how do you guys, you know, how do you how do you work with clients on this? Do you work through a checklist, um, you know, for for all of these things, or do you try and get everything? sort of ready together in, in one go? There's, there's, there's the optimal and there's the reality. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, f from, from either a sell side or a buy side, certainly from a sell side where, where we've acted on that, it's been a case of trying everything um, from day one. Uh, and that is a, you know, uh, that's either driven by just the need to make sure that we've got a full and complete and comprehensive data room to allow it as smoothly as possible, or it's because we've done diligence where we've actually worked with, you know, a business owner or a company to actually understand what the business does. So we can advise them better on where they may need to, you know, be concerned. It's basically a legal health check, if you like, of, of the business that they're intending to just why why would you do due diligence on on a business that you're about to dispose of and of course it doesn't necessarily merit doing that in every in every scenario but it does help uh, ahead of time a seller to surface any issues that they may need to try and head off or may expect to have reflected in you know discussion around price for example so so i, I would say you know the optimal is getting your house in order as early as possible and in as complete a fashion as possible. I mean, certainly when we're on the buy side, um, the worst thing is to basically start with a data room, which is less populated than more and to have things drip fed through because it extends the period for due diligence. It makes it a very choppy process back and forth. Inevitably that has a, a bearing on costs and it just wears people down. Um, it, it definitely, has an impact beyond, you know, this is not even strictly to the legal, this is more about process and, and going through it, but it definitely has an impact. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, you said, you asked about checklists. I mean, yeah, the, the, the typical starting point from a DD process is that the buyer often submits the DD checklist saying, here's all the stuff that we want information on, please, can you provide this? And then that's either a, that's either a trigger point for a seller to actually go away and do that, or if well advised, they may have already used their own checklist from their own advisors to kickstart that process. Um, I think, um, I mean, one, one thing that, uh, and I guess we come onto it to some extent is um, the due diligence is only ever part of it. I mean, as Sam spoke, you have, you know, teasers and, uh, slightly more fulsome information memoranda, perhaps you have management presentations, you know, there are various different means in addition to due diligence by which a buyer gets comfortable with what they may potentially be buying. We find ourselves in the current environment slightly more constrained in terms of the ability to do some of that, you know, actual kick the tires site visits that would amount to due diligence are, you know, less, just not happening at the moment. I mean, travel restrictions have certainly put pay to that. So, I mean, in all honesty, you know, a, a well-ordered comprehensive due diligence data room is, is the best source of information. Where I've seen it um, from a sense is very, very important because it, it, as I say, it helps to surface those issues on which you're, you're going to have to place some focus through the transaction documents. Um, one transaction that we came into, uh, which was a good example of what not to do, was where we were brought into the transaction at what the selling client thought was probably the 11th hour as in documents were already drafted the buyer had uh, produced their draft um, it was a case of can you review this advise us through the through the sale and and just a completion so it was expected to be a relatively short process uh, something more than but not much more than dotting the i's and crossing the perhaps but as we went through that we realized that actually they the parties have been and for almost every single day of those nine months, the seller had been drip feeding an email a day with a bit of information here and a bit of information there. And they had absolutely no data room um, 
as you typically expect, even even on a Google Drive, for example, there was no ordered data room. It was just, here's the information. So when we finally said, well, you're going to have to give a whole bunch of reps and warranties because that's what the seller's asking for about your business. And you're going to have to give some disclosures against that. They then asked us what that meant in practice. And we said, well, you're going to have to reconstruct. We can help you to reconstruct a data room, but you're going to have to reconstruct nine months worth of correspondence into something that you can actually make sense of. And so what they then spent was the next three or four weeks basically trying to reverse engineer a nine month long conversation in something that resembled a data room so that they could point to things and say, this has been given to the buyer. Um, and, and they still managed to find things as they went through that process. I mean, it, it was, you know, it, it was uh, the worst experience I think I've ever had to go through uh, in, in regards to you know, a data room because it just, it just had no structure to it. Um, I mean, the other thing I would just mention there actually, and, and, I, and I raised it earlier, things like Google Drives and Dropbox and so on, certainly in a small business owner context, you know, freely available shared drives are great. Um, but the problem with freely available shared drives is precisely the problem that uh, Sam mentioned, which is uh, you know, once you, you know, NDAs are so good, but only to an extent, and if you're going to court to litigate an NDA, um, your focus is probably in the wrong place because you could have been slightly more diligent in turning on the taps or off the taps in terms of the information flow. Um, people do tend to be quite keen to put things into Google Drives and then forward links. And of course, the wonderful thing about Google Drives is that they can sh stay shared for as long as you forget to unshare them. I did, an, I did my own uh, Google Dropbox box um, audit not that long ago and the number of deals that i'm still party to uh <laughs> on google drives and and not not that i would ever do anything with it but you do wonder how many people have access to all that you know proprietary information um you know if you are going to use from a seller's perspective if you are going to um you know open the kimono then make sure that you've got an ability to to close it um and that you do you do uh, exercise some of your own diligence in how you run due diligence. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very convenient, but um, all too often people just leave information out there. Um, question is what people do with it. That's a whole different question, yeah. but you know, if it's a concern, then you can certainly put the brakes on. So yeah. Um, Chris, can I just uh, bring up two points that uh, based on what Damien just said, if that's okay. The first is it might be useful to explain in, in 10 seconds what the actual M&A process is from start to finish, just the, the different stages. The first stage is, is, find, is finding buyers, as we said, whether they're warm or cold, uh, but at the same time, you need to be preparing all your information. And uh, that means getting the, the, all the management accounts, all your client lists, everything like that ready. And that's when you, you divide the information into two. The first is the teaser, and the second is the information memorandum or the business summary, whatever you want to call it, which is good for the juicy details. Only once you've got those ready, do you then go to market. And then you go to market by reaching out with the teaser to the people you know or the people you don't. And then you enter into discussions only once you've got an NDA signed, do you then allow them to look at the, the business more detailed? Uh, and then they will then spend a bit of time looking at it. You'll have lots of conversations. You need to keep the kimono slightly closed until the due diligence stage. And you only go into the due diligence stage when you've got a letter of intent signed. And that, may, and that could take two or three months after you sent out the initial teaser. And that letter of intent from a buyer says, in effect, I am going to uh, go through the due diligence phase with you because I intend to buy you, assuming that everything is correct. And they will then set out at that LOI stage, that's your intent stage, the rough kinds of details about the, 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 the value and everything. And so you've got an idea. But what they will ask in return, most likely, is a period of exclusivity for between three and six months where they can go through the due diligence and all the, death, the questions around your finances, your IT and all this stuff. Uh, to make sure that you are who you say you are. And then only after the due diligence phase do you then have the final signing. And I said that could be between six and 12 months, that whole process. But what's really important is, is all the way through that is the human side. Now, I mentioned a second ago that one of the biggest issues that leads to deals falling apart is skeletons being found in the cupboard. But by far the biggest issue, the, the biggest reason why deals fall apart is because of humans. And you find that, uh, that either lack of trust is created 
or that there is just an argument or people get greedy or whatever. But uh, you need to be, as the seller, the perfect human being and to make sure everything is ready because first impressions do count. And as Damien said, if you've got a drip fed uh, sort of bit of information that everyone just thinks, what, what the hell, that's not professional. Just get everything ready in one place so that when you do go to market and you have, and you have signed an NDA, you can just give all that information and they can, and they can then be sure that you actually organized because they don't, no one wants to buy really anyone that's disorganized. And so that human side is good. And if you can build up a rapport with the, with the buyer, hence the importance I mentioned earlier about a warm relationship, um, if you can build up the rapport, then when you come across issues in, uh, in the road, because you will, then you'll be able to get over those together. And the amount of times that we've dealt with big road, big roadblocks that could have sunk uh, deal if the people weren't closely aligned in not only in, in what the outcome is, but actually personally aligned because they've got to know each other and built a rapport. Then if that, that hadn't been the case, then those roadblocks would have sunk the deal. So be nice all the way through the deal and, uh, and just basically don't be, don't be alarmed or don't be put off your stride if people try to be nasty to you or whatever, because if they are, then they're, maybe they're not even the right type of buyer because you don't want to be create, setting yourself your, your long term with people who aren't going to treat you well. Right, great, Sam. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I'm kind of conscious of time. The questions have now started to come in. We've got uh, a, a few that have started to come in. And um, I'll, I'll take the latest one first because um, and it's from, from Matthew Shields. Uh, and Matthew, your question's timely because I was just about to talk about this um, in, in this section. Um, Matthew basically asks about um, employees and uh, you know, when looking to acquire a company where the employees have been recognized as a key asset, perhaps due to their expertise or industry relationships, um, how do you structure an acquisition that ensures the employees are tied up in a contract for a certain minimum length of time? And would it need to be on an individual basis with each employee or could it be part of the deal itself? Um, David, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of take that and then I'll, I'll, I'll you know, um, seek, seek Sam and Damon your, your views. But from, from an HR perspective, um, you know, typically this is, this is done um, around the due diligence process part. So as we start to prepare for, for a sale, you start to identify who your critical employees. Um, because if you're, you know, if you're selling more than just a product or the IP or, or stuff like that, and you're selling the whole company, um, then some of the key employees are, are part and parcel of that. So you want to find a way to sort of hook them with a, with a, with a carrot. Um, Typically, these are done through through incentives. Um, you know, so, so there is, you know, whether it's a, a performance-based sort of earnouts or whether it's sort of straight cash. Um, and one of the better ways to try and align people to a slightly more longer-term piece is um, is to kind of stagger those payments, right? So if if you need, you know, so you try and work out how long you need these people to stay with the organisation for post the completion. Um, and then you work backwards from there. So if you, let's argue you want them for two years or, or three years because they hold uh, either critical information or IP or uh, client relationships, et cetera, um, then you, know, you work out the whole payment and then you kind of stagger that uh, over, over a period of time uh, so that they, you know, they, it, it serves as an incentive to stay or alternatively as a, as a disincentive to, uh, to, to kind of leave. Um, Damien, have you sort of you know, done any deals where uh, you, you've had sort of employees en masse or, or even individual contracts where, uh, where these have been reflected? Um, not specifically to that point, but I, th I think, I, I mean, I think in terms of what you said, I mean, yeah, the way you've characterized it is precisely right. It's incentives or deterrence. So re reasons, reasons to stay. I mean, I think, I think to my, in my experience, employees is, often a part of it, but is, it should be a more critical part of it. I mean, let, let's be honest, you know, at the end of the day, the value of any business is in the people that actually work for it. And often, as you say, you have key employees. Um, deals have sometimes restructured because in actual fact, what started out as a purchase of an entire, you know, company through a share sale has turned into a realization on the buyer's side that actually the value of the, the business is in the heads of the key people who, you know, 
have the relationships with the customers or, or, or you know, have, have the IP or whatever it is. And so we've seen on numerous occasions where in actual fact, the conversation has come around to not, can I buy your entire business, but how can I entice these employees to come with um, and bring whatever they can? So it actually becomes a sort of a hybrid, you know, acquire sort of deal as opposed to a, a pure, pure acquisition. Um, I mean, I, 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 I smiled when I saw that question, not in any way being critical, but I remember many, many years when I was junior, you know, expressing it to one of my senior partners at the time, you know, how do you tie people, tie employees into the contract? And that particular individual looked at me and said, well, you can't, you know, they were aghast that I would even think you could lock employees into a contract. I mean, I think, I think it's a bit of a dance between seller and buyer. And there's a few, um, there's a few things that play into that in terms of the sort of how you involve and engage employees in that process. Because of course, if you're selling a business, you don't want to just announce to the entire workforce, Hey, we're selling a business. I can't tell you what it's going to look like the day after we complete. Um, but you have to also, you know, ensure that you preserve as much value for a buyer who's taking over. What you don't want to do is create a situation as a seller where you do announce that you're selling the buyers, you know, happy with it, et cetera, et cetera. And then suddenly a whole bunch of people resign. Um, you, you need to, you need to find a means of actually making sure that the buyer has uh, a way of, of, you know, creating some more value and, and keeping people on board. Um, and those often have been, some of the, the more tricky issues to deal with. I mean, one, one other um, aspect I was just raising the employment side of things is that actually fairly early on from a sell side perspective, but also from a buy side perspective, it's quite important in my view to get a handle on the workforce and any liabilities arising out of that. So if there is a planned restructuring from a buy side, you know, what is it going to take to restructure that workforce? What are the, what are the payouts going to look like? What are statutory entitlements going to look like? I mean, we did a deal where just running a simple spreadsheet on length of service, notice provisions, contractual bonuses, et cetera, et cetera. It was something like a seven to $10 million price difference in the buyer's eyes as to whether they would bring certain people across or not. And, and that leads quite a lot into, you know, what the seller might have to do pre-completion versus what the buyer might want to do post-completion. So I won't labor the point, but I think employees is a really key issue to address upfront as early as possible. Thanks, Damien. Questions are coming thick and fast. I'm just quite keen to, to finish up on, on, on the content. Damien, a question for you on the completion as you brought that up. Um, you know, what are some of the considerations in, in the current environment that people should be aware of? Um, you, you know, I've, I've heard terms you know, from yourself, et cetera, things like sort of uh, remoteness or MAC and, and the, the oft used uh, or perhaps overused force majeure. Um, you know, what can you tell us about this to, to kind of you know, sellers and buyers alike. Yeah, well, they've all, all of those things have very much come back into fashion. I mean, they, they seem to run through cycles. Um, I, I guess you could sort of run a straw poll, hands up if you haven't received a force majeure note, briefing note from a law firm in the last six or eight weeks. Um, I'd be surprised if there were any hands up. Um, the, I mean, f f force, force majeure clause we've started to see. So force majeure, for those that, that aren't aware, is basically a creature of contract um, and only a creature of contract so it's what the parties decide it to be and it basically allows one or both of the parties or if there are more parties you know to excuse themselves from performance if there are certain circumstances beyond their control so you know civil war riot strike land you know uh, natural natural disasters the like we've seen epidemic now not surprisingly creep into that um Although one would argue that we're sort of already in that situation. So force majeure clauses have already, you know, been triggered. Uh, people are just thinking about the next steps. Um, material adverse change or material adverse effect clauses. We've seen those to a limited extent. Uh, I mean, we're working on a fundraising at the moment where there is a material adverse change clause from, from a previous round. What's quite interesting, and I think this is a, this is an interesting overview generally, insofar as how things are playing out, is that people are aware that that exists. It's sort of the you know the last resort button um, very often, and it gives it gives a buyer a way out if they can you know point to a material adverse change between let's say signing and completion. Um, our take on that in that particular context is that material adverse change, certainly in terms of market if market effect, has sort of already happened. The question is, you know, how much more volatility is there going forward? What do you point to it? And and I think the reality comes to play, which is it's all very well to have a material adverse change clause, but if that really does change the parameters of um, of doing a deal, 
then all, all well and good. But in some circumstances, we've seen that actually that doesn't necessarily change the underlying fundamentals. It just causes parties to think and reflect a little bit more. Um, what I would say in terms of mitigants around that, um, we've seen one deal fall apart because of COVID-19. Um, the interesting thing about that was that it, is it was basically a, a share deal that became an asset deal that I think became an acquihire. And so in that particular context, it was a case of let's wait and see three, four, six months what the business looks like. And maybe there's an opportunity to pick up the people, you know, further down, down the track rather than the business. Um, what I would say in terms of mitigants is there is a lot more scrutiny if people aren't walking away from deals or if they aren't just relying on sort of nuclear options in their contracts. What they are doing is perhaps more thorough due diligence, uh, less time between signing and completion, um, and certainly much more oversight and stringent monitoring of what does happen between signing and completion. So if you're not completing on the same day that you're signing a deal and there is a period between for whatever reason, then, um, then I think that period should be as, as short as possible um, because of course circumstances can change quickly. So all of these things are relevant considerations um, at the moment and will continue to be for some time. Um, but how they're used and, and you know, for whom they are important is, is really the thing to think about there. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll rattle on to the post-completion sort of considerations now, which, which, is, uh, which is an important part of the whole thing. I mean, once, you, know, once the, you know, once the documents have been inked and contracts have been signed, um, certainly from a people side of things, um, you know, we, we, we talk very often about cultural integration. So that, uh, that involves um, re-engaging with, with the employees in the company that's being sold or has been sold. Um, and, and how does the acquiring organization then deal with that? Um, you know, these could be through uh, sort of multi sort of communication channels. Um, you know, you've seen sort of town halls, emails, intranets, um, you know, speeches from some various leadership uh, sort of, uh, you know, people from the leadership team. Um, the key here is, is truth and honesty. You know, where you have answers, um, you know, the advice I'd give is um, if you don't know the answer, then, you know, just be honest and say we, we haven't thought about that yet or, or come come clean um transparency is is, is really important um, another way to kind of get um, people together and and engage with a new organization is you know doing things like planning off sites which may not be possible at this stage with covid but uh, you know it, it's certainly something that, that that has been done um and also communication around you know if there's a new strategy or you know values and vision rollouts etc you know all these things help bind the the employees from the company that has been acquired um into uh, you know in, into the company that that's acquiring them sam do, you know can you spend a sort of minute or two talking about your thoughts around you know any sort of post completion considerations that uh, that you might have seen or, or advise clients on yeah i'm just looking at the questions because i'm going to link in one of the questions to that uh which is that someone's asking about the difference between minority investment and 100% buy and that has a big impact on on what happens afterwards and the reason is because if you are selling all of the company then you become very quickly subservient to everything that happens you know within the buyer and that means that you need to have a very robust plan uh, post completion to make sure that you are able to keep to the terms and conditions that you agree with to the to, uh, on the sale. So, for example, if you agree that you're going to keep your profit level up at X and your revenue up at Y, then you need to make sure that the company, that your part of the company, is set up to keep doing that. Because there are tricks that can happen where a buyer that gets you know, buys company X. Uh, company X is told that if they don't achieve certain levels of financial return, then they will uh, not get all the money they need for the, the, all the money they, they thought they would get from the, from the sale. But then the buyer says, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. And they're like, well, that's half my revenue. Or yes, you're not allowed to operate in Thailand anymore, but that's a quarter of my revenue. And so you need to have all the way through the due diligence process questions about what will happen after the after the sale is completed and make sure that the operational realities and operational prescriptions that are put in place allow you still to make all the targets that you are set post completion. And that includes, for example, having your, your staff allowed to keep doing what they want to do or when do you start shifting the culture? You know, in the creative industry, that's a big issue because if you've got a certain 
culture within your, your company and then you sell to a much bigger organization who has a much more staid and strict culture, then people will leave straight away. But if you can keep your own culture for a year or two and allow that smoother transition, then that means that you will are more likely to keep people. But it does go back to making sure you've got all this written down and ex- properly examined before, uh, before you actually sign the deal. Okay, I just I just very quickly add to that on because I think it's a good point and there's a lot of different parameters in that significant minority investor question um, and I think it's you know if, if you're looking the, the big thing that comes out of any significant minority investor that's going to be on their mind is minority protection and it goes to that point that Sam was raising about control if you've got someone who's a purely a financial investor um, and is happy to sit back and be a significant minority and it's an economic deal for them it's a it's an economically driven decision to invest then it's a very different set of considerations than if they are a strategic looking to get a, a foothold. And um, we've, we've done something with a significant minority where they were pre- precisely in the deal to get transfer of technology and know-how. And so the issues and conversations around competition in certain places, non-competition, et cetera, et cetera, became the big part of the deal there. So I, w- I would say it's, it's, there are a number of different things, but yeah, it's just to add to that. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that's the end of our content, and I know we've answered a couple of questions along the way towards the end. But let me try and jumble up a couple which basically talk about pricing. So we've got uh, two questions which more or less ask um, a, a similar thing, which is, you know, valuation methodologies, principles, um, how do you work out a sale price? Is there a formula? Um, Sam, any, any kind of thoughts uh, to, to the answer of this question? Yeah, sure. So there are theoretically quite a few different ways to value a company. And in fact, it is uh, rare, almost never heard that you will see uh, companies valued and the, the type of the deal agreed to be exactly the same company to company. Everything is always uh, bespoke um, for that particular deal. Um, and if you've got a very good advisor and one that's regulated, etc., then that means that they'll be able to guide you a lot more through this process. But... Um, in general terms, you've got two, two ways of valuing the company uh, if you're selling it as a viable, uh, con- viable concern. The first is uh, the most common, which is as a percentage of your profit, and your profit can be calculated in different ways, so I won't go into that, but basically, is it five times your, your annual profit, is it ten times your annual profit, something like that? And what you normally find is that you get a higher price as a term, what's called a multiple, uh, if you're rarer, if, you've, if you're more strategic interest to the buyer. The other way is uh, as, a, as a multiple of revenue. And that tends to be quite rare because a lot of people, you don't want to buy a company just for its revenue, you want to buy a company for its profit because that's the only way that you'll, you actually make money in the end. Um, but if you are, say, a company that's early stage, you've got technology, you haven't been able to monetize properly, or you're, f- or you're a failing company and you haven't got any profits, then often it will be as a percentage of revenue, sometimes one or two times revenue. Um, it really d- it depends entirely on the sector and the stage of your company. But in, f- in effect, those are the two different mechanisms. You do have also the potential to sell to aqua hired or to aqua sell, where you basically just sell the people in which case there's a whole different formula uh, and you can just do asset sale where people will just buy the assets and that's based on a completely different formula which is which is completely dependent on the type of assets there um, so there we go okay thank you we have a question here from henry tan um damien maybe you could you could sort of start off on this what what is the single most deal breaker in m a that you have encountered I mean, is, is, is there one or are there many or? Uh, single, no, I, I don't think there's a single most. I, mean, I guess where I've seen things, where I've seen things not work out, if that's the metric of a deal breaker. Um, it, it's rarely been over price uh, because by and large, you know, there, there's a chiseling, they, they, there may be a chiseling here and there, but by and large, the you know, the, the valuation way up front often before you get involved and therefore people are comfortable. I mean, you, you're not going to walk into, you know, if you walk into a Rolls Royce showroom expecting to pay, you know, what you pay for a mini and someone says actually it's going to be a million bucks, you're going to walk out pretty quickly. You're not going to start haggling over, you know, whether it should be 100,000 or a million. So, you know, often it's chiseling of price, not price. Um, I would say the skeletons in the closet. Uh, so 
things that surface through due diligence things that are going to you know from our perspective are most often going to be the things that, that that you know drive people away and that that i would say tends to happen fairly early on if you're into documentation due diligence is ongoing or has been completed and it's a question of negotiating who gives what in or who gets what in terms of warranties in terms of protections in terms of ongoing liabilities then um th those those things typically don't kill um so i would say it's more often than not it's it's just yeah it's things that surface in due diligence and, and actually i would say that where we have someone walking away but in someone saying well that aspect of the business looks less palatable now or less attractive now than it did before let's restructure it or a certain aspect of the deal because in actual fact we don't want to deal with jurisdiction x or we don't need jurisdiction x so it, it, it tends to result in parties wanting to continue and to, to structure towards the end i've only ever been in a situation where you know one or two deals just simply haven't gone ahead um and as i say one has been driven by economic circumstances the other was just that it, it just ultimately they didn't want to do the deal at the end of the day. They just, but. A couple more questions. I know we're a little bit over time, but let's try and see if we can, we can uh, answer these. Um, uh, are you seeing more lender-led sales processes than is the norm and any sectors in particular um, that lenders are pushing for sales in? Damien, Sam? The, yeah, the, the, the short answer to that is not yet. And I think a, a lot in large part because, I mean, we're, we're seeing lots of, and, and, you know, I think if you look at how law firms are positioning themselves as to, there's a big uptick in getting excited about potential restructuring and insolvency activity. In actual fact, I think that's more restructuring activity because the reality is that a lot of governments have passed legislation around the world that have just put moratoriums on enforcement. So, you know, lenders haven't, you know, in an ordinary sort of sector crisis or, you know, market event driven crisis, you might see certain sectors um, be enforced. You know, we've seen it in the shipping sector, we've seen it in energy, we've seen it in various different sectors um, by the current circumstances. And so when you're looking at lender enforcement, which might result in sales process, forced sales process, is the question of where's the available market? Either that or the, or the point on moratoriums, which is they're actually not allowed at the moment under certain protective pre legislation to take enforcement action so the answer the short answer to that is no um, there are a lot of conversations happening around restructuring of deals whether it's lender driven um, I mean I think the, the reality as well is it depends on the lenders it depends on the basis on which if they financed at the corporate level it's a vastly different conversation to if they're a secured lender at an asset or project level um, and you know, if ultimately their recourse is through assets, the question is, do those assets still have the value? So it may not even result in enforced sales. Um, but we are certainly seeing, I mean, aviation is a big sector that we play into. There are a lot of conversations going on, not surprisingly, around restructuring. Um, some of those uh, conversations inevitably have resulted in uh, bankruptcy, but that's not necessarily lender driven. It's just the reality, the harsh economic reality of flying planes in the current environment. Terrific. Thank you very much, Damien. I think that um, brings us to the close um, of, this, uh, of this session. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Damien and Sam uh, for, for, for agreeing to be speakers on this. Um, I mean, I certainly learned a lot and, and, and found it very insightful. And I, and I hope uh, that um, the, the listeners uh, have found it equally um, interesting and insightful. Um, Couple of things to, to, to bring about um, in terms of the Chamber's upcoming um, events, which will flash up on your screen uh, in, in, in a second or so. Um, so these, these are the upcoming events. Um, the, there's three, um, and you can always go on to the uh, Bridgeham website uh, to, to, to see more of the detail. Uh, and the other thing to mention clearly is uh, the, uh, the October um, Annual Business Awards, the ABAs. Um, again, all that information is on the, um, on the Britcham website. Uh, before I close, uh, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, thank, thank all the participants and for, for, for dialing in and giving us their time. Uh, you will all be getting a feedback email, uh, which, which will land in your inboxes in the next day or so. Um, really appreciate if you can complete that, uh, as these are immensely helpful 
in, in planning future, future events. Thank you everyone again for joining us uh, this morning and stay safe. And with that, we draw the session to a close. All right. <clears throat>